On today's Locked On Cavs, I answer your questions, including, is Marcus Morris a necessity for the Cleveland Cavaliers once the playoffs actually start? We'll talk about that more on today's Locked On Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. As I had mentioned before, this is Locked on Cavs. I am Evan Damerell flying solo once again to answer you, our gracious listeners, our wonderful listeners' questions regarding the subject matter of this show five days a week and the number one Cleveland Cavaliers podcast, the Cleveland Cavaliers. But before we get started, uh, we did get asked a question in our YouTube comments on Tuesday, Mark 25th show about the Cavs possibly drafting Bronny James to parlay that into an opportunity for LeBron to retire a Cavalier and I don't think there's much depth to it right now just because LeBron knows what LeBron is going to do and I think he's kind of flip-flopped on the answer a few times but yeah I, I do know for a fact that the Cavs have been keeping tabs on Bronny since he was in high school um, whether that means he becomes an instant member of Cleveland's lineup next year or he starts his career in the G League it all depends on where he gets drafted or if he even declares for the draft he may return to Southern Cal next year and just play another season there. But we'll see what happens. But today, we're going to talk about a little bit about a veteran known as, <clears throat> excuse me, Marcus Morris. Starting with this question, which we got from Dylan Work, which asked, do you see Marcus Morris having a similar level of impact on the Cavs locker room that Shannon Fry had on the 2016 Cavs in terms of bringing a missing cultural element? And I'll be honest, I think that's a really good question. It's a little hard to answer, though, just because Channing was definitely a vibes guy in the aspect of he diffused the tension in Cleveland's locker room, especially when things were tight, because, you know, there's just, you know, the sudden expectation to win right away um, when LeBron James is on your roster. And he and Richard Jefferson kind of became fan favorites because of, you know, the road trip and podcast and everything they did. And I, I don't know Marcus Morris from Adam. He hasn't been around very long. Um, his 10-day contract does expire after the Cavs play the Hornets today. And, well, the day after that, I, I don't have the exact date in front of me. Don't hold me quotable or accountable. It expires on Thursday. I'm doing the math in my head. But I think just Morris isn't going to be the guy that brings the Cavs together in that sense. Like, as the guy who is willing to be the the one who keeps things light i think that's more of george niang's role but i think morris can have that capability to be a player that does bring the Cavs together you certainly saw it against the charlotte hornets when he throat chopped nick richards the other night and he has claimed that um he is going to keep playing with that level of physicality all season long and he's going to start kind of forming the quote-unquote I did the air quotes after the fact, by the way, no dung zone for Cleveland. And so we shall see. Um, I I don't want to put the expectation of a championship on this Cavs team. They have to get out of the first round first and get that stink off of them first. But I think Morris is just a good locker room veteran just because like he's a dude who provides him an edge. And if you wanted to think of guys in that vein, I think you should think more about, I don't know, Kendrick Perkins, maybe I think Perk, um certainly does kind of fit that mold of just an enforcer uh an mfer um you, you can fill in the spaces if you will but a guy who's just willing not to take any crap and is willing to dish it out and back it up because he saw it against richards he kind of has a track record with that but yeah i think that's a great question and um in a similar vein jumping ahead to another marcus morris question this one is from amori saying are the Cavs signing marcus morris senior so I think this question more so has to do with the fact that Morris's 10 days is going to expire soon. Um, And just based on the conversations I've kind of had around the league, it's kind of giving me the impression that the Cavs are definitely keen on the idea of signing Marcus Morris to some form of a long-term contract and just keeping him around long term too. Um, I think that just makes sense because you need that veteran presence. It's the 15th roster spot. You're not going to be doing much 
with it at that point. Like, I, I don't know if Marcus Morris even cracks the playoff rotation for the Cavs, but he can be a guy who either you call in his number to rough somebody up or kind of be that spark and catalyst like he was against the Hornets. And he's perfectly comfortable doing that. And it's not going to hurt the Cavs, but I think if you want to be smart about it and just depending on how you structure it, you maybe sign him to another 10 day deal or you just kind of pull out the rug and say, okay, Marcus, you have done plenty on and off the court as just a catalyst for us. You provide us quality minutes, even though you have hardly played this season and you have definitely proven enough, especially based on your record with JB Bickerstaff or your report with JB Bickerstaff to stick around long term. And I think he could be a valuable vet come playoff time just because he does have that experience and he does have the ability to just kind of battle and just be a guy who is not afraid to not just get in the face of an opposing team, but also his teammates and hold them accountable too. And yeah, Tristan Thompson can do that. I think George Yang can too, but Morris is just kind of grittier. He's in that vein of Max Struess where like he's gritty and he kind of gives an edge that the Cavs sometimes are lacking. One last question about Morris real quick comes from Cleveland's fake ESPN uh, <clears throat> in parentheses 42 and 25. Um, after this game against Charlotte, it will likely go to 43 and 25, but do you, he asks, or they ask, do you think the Cavs will sign Marcus Morris again after this season of free agency? I'm wondering about how the cap space will work. Again, I think this is a good question. I think it's fair. Um, the Cavs are a team that are financially strapped, but when you look at Marcus Morris, if he has a good enough time in Cleveland, wants to stick around long term, and he is represented by Clutch Sports still, I believe. Like they have a good relationship with Clutch, the Cavs do, but. If you want to look at it from the long-term logistics of it, yeah, it makes sense for <clears throat> that. But the financial ramifications of it are kind of a moot point because I think, and I'm just being fair, like Marcus Morris may get a healthier contract offer elsewhere, but the Cavs could likely sign him to the vet men or they use a portion of their mid-level exception to sign him. But like, it's not going to be like astronomical money, especially just because when this team returns next season, and we'll talk about actually the future of one player in the final segment of the show is to stick around, but depending on how things go the remainder of this year in the playoffs, especially if the Cavs bring him back either permanently or on another 10 day. Yeah. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. He provides equality depth as a bigger three slash four player that can hit three pointers. And he is a guy that at least has the attention of the dudes in the locker room. And I think you can't really ignore that whatsoever. So yeah, I, I don't think it's too bad, but like the financial ramifications of it just aren't too dire because they can use a partial portion of their mid-level exception or just sign them to the vet men, which <clears throat> depending on how things go, like it's you could find a roster spot for them if need be. But let's dive into more of your guys' questions. We're actually going to talk more about um, Evan Mobley in the upcoming segment. But first, got to give a quick word from today's sponsors. This episode of Locked on Cavs is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit for your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. And we are back with more Locked on Cavs. And let's dive right back into your questions. But first, I actually have to let you guys know about something. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn on down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked on Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest sports without all the screaming. Locked on Sports today brings you the can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. But let's talk about one Evan Mobley. First question coming in hot from Twitter from Miller, also known at Miller18289. 
The contract situation involving Evan Mobley is intriguing. Do you think the Cavs should wait it out and let him play as an RFA next season to see if he improves and moves up? Or should he take a chance on his long-term development and give him the Supermax, in parentheses, this summer? And just to follow up, Tall Guy, or Tall 6 UY, asks, Evan Mobley's offensive development appears to have slowed significantly. How much higher is Evan Mobley's ceiling? So I'm going to take both these questions on at the same time. And we're going to have a pretty long talk about <clears throat> Evan. This is the Evan to Evan segment. So Evan Mobley has played less than 40 games this season. I believe game 41 will come against the Hornets this evening, but it's hard to evaluate where he's at still as a player because one, he's missed so much time and two, there is not enough sample or f- just any footage or data in general that shows us that proverbial year three leap. But regardless of this, um, I don't think you really want to mess around with that kind of money and you just want to sign him to the Supermax right away because he is a franchise cornerstone for this Cavs team just from purely what he brings to the table for Cleveland defensively as a player. Um, I shared this on the other show for month or Tuesday after the Cavs beat the Hornets. Um, without Mobley, the Cavs wouldn't be in the position they're in because he was, has been a catalyst for them defensively since his rookie season and has continued to carry the load for the Cavs defensively every single season. It, it's been especially apparent when he was sidelined with this recent ankle injury with the Cavs being outscored by most opponents, losing more often than not, having a negative 2.5 point differential heading into that game. Um, just really holding them back, like having Mobley more than erases that 2.5 diff- point differential and also just kind of eclipses that. And I, I'll say this, like I think Darius Garland having, as and Garland is a recent example of a Cavs signing a player to a rookie max extension. Um, Garland is a recent example of like a guy who had, I mean, a phenomenal, phenomenal year three leap. He was an all-star. Um, he could have flirted with all NBA honors. If he really wanted, he could have been a most improved player candidate, depending on how the field shaked out. I don't remember the finalists for these awards. It's been too long ago. But yeah, it was it was a no-brainer at the time to sign him to a rookie max extension. And I think looking at Mobley, despite the fact that this season to me has been a lost season, and we'll talk more about maybe the flashes and where he goes from here in a second, but he is an all defensive player. He was a finals for defensive player of the year last season. I think if he had <clears throat> not missed so many games this year and actually played enough to qualify, he would be a finalist for both and also maybe first team all defense, just depending on how he the rest of the season shook out for him. But it's just unfortunate because in this is kind of indicative of this Cavs season overall. Like the Cavs have been hamstrung by injuries all season long, and it's really thrown a wrench on what we can figure out just as flies in the wall or people observing the games of what kind of player Evan Mobley can be as a prospect. And to me, I think you look at the game against Charlotte or you look at how he looked when he came out of his knee injury, like that is the player Evan Mobley can be where he can show his bona fide bona fides, if you will, of a do it all big man that can provide you passing, um, Scoring on the interior, the perimeter, rebounding, defense, whether it's defending the paint and protecting the rim or switching out in isolation, which he still grades out as one of the NBA's top overall isolation defenders, which is phenomenal because he was the number one isolation defender last season. But I think, like again, you don't really want to mess with money at that point. You want to maybe invest in the potential, and I think that that's part of why the Cavs were also feeling it was a no-brainer to sign Garland to one because you're investing in the potential of him as a player. And I think looking ahead, yeah, you want to invest in the potential of Mobley because he can and will have the ability to be a franchise cornerstone. He could be your number one player, depending on what happens with Donovan Mitchell. He could be your number two player if Mitchell sticks around long-term too, or maybe he supersedes and leapfrogs Mitchell eventually. But in terms of his offensive game, that's just that's where the question is. I think defensively we know how good he is and that's why he's worth the investment to begin with but like offensively i think it's fair to question where he's at just because the three-point shot wasn't a sudden thing despite the fact that he has been working on it constantly since he first came into the nba or the passing is a work in progress because his handle still is a little loose and sometimes he can turn over the ball at inopportune moments but then you see it all click 
like it did against the Hornets, which they are a bad team, but I think that allows Mobley to maybe have some of that creative flexibility to show off his bona fides and also just kind of make him more of an impactful player all across the Rubicon. But you look at that or you flip the script over to how he kind of just came out flat to start his third season. It's hard to gauge where he is because he's also not a player that is driven by scoring the basketball constantly. I think he is a player where counting stats don't really track how impactful he can be. I think a lot of it is the eye test. And I, I think, and I understand why you want him to emerge and just kind of be more of a dominant force. But I think that is part and parcel of some of the issues of how this roster is currently constructed too. And it limits some of what Mobley can do offensively. I, personally believe Mobley is better suited to play the center long term for the Cavs and maybe explore the uncomfortable conversation of how you build around that this summer and maybe that involves Jared Allen or maybe Donovan Mitchell kind of forces your hand to do something else but Evan Mobley in my opinion is better suited as a five for the Cavs because they play faster offensively they maybe take a bit of a dip defensively because Mobley is kind of being asked to do a lot more in terms of protecting the interior but is able to unlock more offensively through his passing and just kind of having guys play off the ball of him. And also, you're not maybe being too, too reliant on the fact that like they need him, they is in the Cavs, to take four to five three-pointers a game. And maybe he still gives you those two to three attempts per game, but he's more so doing damage on the interior as like the clearly cut number two option in Cleveland's offensive hierarchy. But it's just hard to finally get or fully get a, a firm understanding of where things stand for Mobley, but heading into this summer, um, or just whenever the conversation comes up, like you don't let him test RFA. You it's fair to question maybe like what he can provide you offensively, but I don't think he's plateaued in any sense. I just think it's hard just to fully gauge what he is, but he's a no brainer um to just sign to a rookie max extension. You want to lock that up as quickly as possible so you don't lose him to another team that either has the cap space and restricted free agency to let him kind of test the waters and maybe price himself out of what the caps can afford or just because of team building opportunities or anything else. But yeah, it's an interesting question, but I still am also a firm believer in Evan Mobley too. I think he's the best player from his draft class. He's one of the best players at his position overall, but we will see. Um, I also just think the Cavs are going to be investing in the future and the upside of the player. And if you look at it from that lens, it makes a ton of sense on why they want to do it. But We're going to take another quick break. we got two sponsors lined up, including a new one entering the fold, but we will be answering the final round of questions about a certain player whose future may or may not be in in, doubt, all but certain, I should say. But we'll talk about that in a second. Today's episode of Locked on Cavs is brought to you by Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences from smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing television, which provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have it, and you will, with the Fire TV. Fire TV recently also created the Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for that includes us, Goblins and Ghouls, at Locked On, and most of the big pro leagues and league conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date with all the latest in this world of sports, including the March Madness, NBA, MLB, and most importantly, the biggest brand of them all, Locked On Cavs. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com forward slash Locked On. Fire TV. Today's episode of Locked on Cavs is also brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that who likes to push things further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a line of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure like Mario to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and city escapes in the like Sonic Adventure and the perfect mid-sized crossover for anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and the Google Play Store are built into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. Meanwhile, the 2024 Nissan Armada will change what you expect from a full-sized SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that you can seat up to 8 people in in a first-class luxury in style that can now tow bigger and explore further. Once you'll do, and you open your eyes, you realize right in front of you is the 2024 Armada. 
take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them out today at Shop Nissan USA. We are back with the final segment of Locked on Cavs, the only Cleveland Cavaliers podcast to feature human voices and also is well-funded and supported by capitalism, as you heard from the latest sponsors. But in this final segment, we are asked plenty. And you probably guessed at this point, Donovan Mitchell. But first, I have to give a quick shout-out to Josh Conter, who said, Assuming health, big assumption, what can you expect to watch from the main guys come playoff time? For example, off recent history. Mitchell, three-point shooting. Garland, turnovers and drivability. Struce, three-point shooting. Evan, uh, not myself, Evan Mobley. Play out of PNR three on four on threes. Allen, defensive rebounds and physicality. So, John, I th- that's a great question. It really is, and I think it's a lot to process. And to be frank, this might seem like a bit of a cop out, but you actually just handed us gold, my friends. So, we will be dedicating an episode to your question to talk about it more, probably when we get closer to the postseason. So, keep tuned and stay tuned for that. But first question about Mr. Donovan Mitchell from opinionated. At go XXX long, go in the um, Louisiana sense. If Mitchell resigns under the conditions that the Cavs build a true championship contending team, what is their path to do that? How much trade value does Mobley and Garland really have? Could they land a top 25 player to p- pair with Mitchell, or, or can they contend with the core four? So, this is a bit of an interesting question. Um, I don't know why you would actively shop Evan Mobley or Darius Garland. I know people will point to the fact that the Cavs were really contending when Garland was out and Mitchell was running point, but there's a certain limit to just the playmaking and creativity you get from that. And also, like you're seeing it now, Donovan Mitchell has knee problems because he's been overtaxed and run into the ground. And he's also admitted that like Darius Garland is the best point guard he ever played with. And he's not trying to like shade or throw any disrespect towards Mike Conley or anything. He's just being completely honest. Like Garland is the best point guard Donovan Mitchell's played with and just kind of shares the load with him offensively. And I feel like this conversation just wouldn't be happening as much if Garland was a hundred percent all season and we didn't have a lost season with him like Mobley. And I laid out the bona fides. I keep saying that word. I just like saying it. Um, about Mobley last segment. I don't think you entertain trading him at this point either, just because he's still on his rookie contract. You're going to sign him to the rookie max extension regardless. And you really don't want to give up on in-house developed talent like that super easily, unless to your point, if a top 25 player comes along, sure, maybe you entertain that. But instead, I think you just look to flesh out this roster. Maybe you find improvements elsewhere. Maybe you look to Brooklyn and say, Hey, Is Cam Johnson like a viable option as a starting four for us, even though he doesn't have maybe the upside of like a Jared Allen? I I think Allen is just going to be the trade casualty in this scenario if you really want to make an upgrade there. Or like you look at Mikhail Bridges and maybe you prevent him from going to the Knicks and you try to pry him over to Cleveland. Like, is he an option too? I think so. Um, And then like you look at guys like, is Isaac Coro around long term? Like, is he going to be a restricted free agent this summer? Like, that could shake things up. Um, Max Struess, you'd assume, is with the team long term. George Deang is with the team long term as well. Like you have a lot of guys and pieces in place to be creative. Even Karis Levert's contract and like what you want to work with there too. But it's gonna cause you to make a sacrifice if you want to make like a big, big move of this quote unquote core four. And it, it, the likely casualty, unfortunately, despite being Mister Consistent and arguably the Cavs' second or third best player, depending on. How this season's just shaked out for them is it's Jared Allen. So you have to weigh your options. I don't know if Allen necessarily gets you a top 25 player because you gave up so many picks already to get Mitchell in the first place. So you think about the idea of just running it back with the core four and just really try to establish things. And I think this is a perfect way to lead into the final question regarding Donovan Mitchell from Aberdeen. If the Cavs underachieve in the playoffs, will Spida, and that's Donovan Mitchell's nickname, which he gave himself, I learned. Decision to stay be affected on whether or not they retain JB, as in John Blair Bickerstaff, a.k.a. JB Bickerstaff, a.k.a. the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I think this is a valid question. I think if the Cavs flame out in the first round again, you have to do some type of wholesale change. I think you do need to shake up the coaching staff a little bit, maybe bring in a more offensive-minded coach. Um, A guy I have 
Bird could always be like an option for any team. Um, I think he's a guy the Cavs have entertained in the past too, is Sacramento Kings lead assistant coach. I think he's the associate head coach actually under Mike Brown, but Jordy Fernandez, he used to coach the Cleveland Charge for quite a few years. He's very successful. He actually has a PhD in basketball offensive theory and how to maximize offensive opportunities in terms of efficiency and would be a real tonal change from J.B. Bickerstaff, um, but just from offense to defense, but like if it's not him, I think Alex Jensen could be a candidate too, who is a guy who is actually pretty close to Donovan Mitchell from their time together in Utah, and I think he's with the Mavericks now, but um, also used to coach the Cleveland Charge, I think could be a serious candidate too. I think you just look across the Rubicon and the spectrum of the NBA, maybe... Um, <laughs> Maybe Dan Gilbert uh, chases after a white whale again and goes after John Calipari because it, it appears Calipari's on his way out from Kentucky. So who knows? Um, but to answer the question, I think if the Cavs flame out in the first round, um, maybe it does change the dialogue a bit. But based on what I've heard and the conversations I've had, both privately um, with people across the NBA and just like with people who kind of have an understanding of Donovan Mitchell's decision making. I'm not quoting on Mitchell's behalf or anything, but like kind of just the vibe they get. It feels more and more likely that Mitchell re-ups with the Cavs. It, they don't know or the people I've spoken with don't really have a clear understanding of how long that would be, but I think he's going to give the Cavs a little bit of runway and grace to kind of continue building this quote-unquote contender around him and to go off that first question, like it's tricky because the Cavs are limited asset-wise and they may have to break a big egg to make this on what happen, but a lot of it could be a coaching change too, which I think JB is a great coach. I think he really showed his credentials as a head coach for this team, especially when they were dealing with so many injuries after those two losses to Boston, they lost Mobley and Garland. Like that could have been a flashpoint that changed the entire season. But instead you saw them kind of dig deep and continue to win. And you see like that he has the respect and attention of this locker room. And that's a very underrated and valuable ability, but we shall see. Um, but if the Cavs do lose in the first round, you do need, do need to make wholesale change. One, to keep Donovan Mitchell, who is the most important free agent the Cavs have had in a pretty long time since LeBron James, I'd say, just in terms of uncertainty around his future. Um, and maybe if that requires a coaching change. Um, unfortunate that Atlanta scooped up Quinn Snyder when they did, but I feel like if Snyder was available, the Cavs would definitely warm up to that subject too. But we shall see. Um, I know that's probably not the answer anyone's looking for, but I think there's just a lot of uncertainty just from everywhere about what Mitchell's going to do, and no one will really know until this season ends, because the Cavs can make like a serious playoff run. They really show some guts and some credence, and one, prove Mitchell that this is worthwhile long-term, and two, like, G.B. Bickerstaff has evolved as a coach and can really like schematically plan things to carry them out of the first round and maybe out of the second round, if, depending on how the series goes into the conference finals, or God willing, the NBA Finals, but I just don't see that happening. But that's going to do it for today's Locked On Cavs. And on our way out, I just wanted to remind everyone that Locked On has launched their first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. It's now also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On plus our national show covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today on the free Fire TV channels app. But like I said, folks, it's going to do it for today's show. I am Evan Damerell. I'll be back tomorrow going solo again because loyal subordinate Jackson Flickinger was not as loyal as I thought. In my head right now, but I'll be back tomorrow to talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers taking on the Charlotte Hornets. If Max Struess is back, didn't even mention that he could be back against Charlotte. That's a pretty big get for the Cavs as well. But we'll talk about that and just how Cleveland looks against Charlotte as they look to gear up for a Friday matchup against Philly as well, where... I will be joined by super friend of the program, Jordan Christmas, to talk all about the current state of the Sixers and the Cavs and that Friday matchup. But thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. I'm Evan. Check me out at Write Down Euclid. And until next time, thank you for listening.